focus today, uh, as has just been explained, is to talk about why participation matters in the first place, and more importantly, why it matters differently for different people, um, to consider the way it's been institutionalised in the arts, and I guess, you know, um, critique to what extent some of the rhetoric is actually true in practice. And then I'm going to look at um, some examples of practice from the UK and Denmark, uh, which, which may partly be specific to a European context, but I think also can be kind of generalised to other contexts as well. Um, so, but before doing that, I guess um, start thinking about where I'm coming from and the starting point is to think about what are we talking about in terms of traditional arts governance. And I would argue that traditional arts governance is very strongly governed by a narrow range of voices, um, what some people have called cultural elites, uh, Hewitt and the Great and the Good, a narrow band of professional arts elite who, who decide what's good for us, in effect. And that's based on an assumption that culture is neutral, that culture is universal, that there is something good about culture itself, um, which I'm going to kind of unpick a bit today. It also, I think, adds to a sense that there's a very clear divide between professional and everyday cultural practices, which I will argue is part of the problem in the cultural sector that creates the problems of participation we talk about, and the social inequities in society become replicated in the cultural sphere. I've put a couple of quotes there to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about. Bourdieu talks, talks about the interminable circuit of interlegitimation, the way that the cultural sector looks in on itself and talks to itself too much, and the need for it to look outward is what I'm marking. Um, and kind of my point about the narrow range of voices demonstrated by the Arts Council, who themselves acknowledge in, in an English context that a very small number of people make all the decisions about arts and culture in the UK. But if that's the traditional model, as has just been demonstrated in the um, opening speech, uh, there's a growing discourse about, dis about participation and indeed people saying that we're now entering a phase which is a much more widely participatory culture. And I guess I can, again, I'm going to question how true that is in reality. So the claim for the participatory culture is based on a wide range of research on participation over a very long period, not specifically um, to the cultural sector, but more generally about participation. And uh, refer to the work from the 60s in America, um, in the 80s from Brazil, uh, across the globe we can see evidence of that. There's also, since the millennium, a, a rise in literature and talk about um, the opportunities of new technology to increase participation, to mean that whether we like it or not, we're being talked about in social media. And so that, again, kind of adding to that sense that we have a much more participatory culture. And also, it's very clearly a priority in public policy, not just cultural policy, but across, uh, the, across all areas of public policy, to think about how the public are more actively involved in the... the, um, in the both in the services that are provided, but also in decision-making about them. But despite those claims, if we actually look at what's really happening in the world, we know there's rising inequality. Participation is not making us more equal. Um, so if we are in a participatory culture, then it's a very unequal culture. There's actually also, if we look at quantitative data, evidence of declining engagement and participation in traditional activities, so whether that's voting or leisure activities attending the arts. And I emphasise the traditional because there's a question here about what do we mean by participation anyway. Um, but again, thinking about traditional activities, surveys certainly across Europe demonstrate that actually there's a direct correlation between who takes part in cultural activities and indeed in other um, activities and the social and educational position that they, stay, um, that they exist in, with the most wealthy and the most educated the most likely to take part. And therefore, a question about whether um, policy and funding are actually just funding the wealthy uh, rather than make, providing opportunities for uh, people with less resources. <clears throat> and actually, certainly within both a British and Danish context, which, as I said, is um, the focus of what I'm going to look at, 
uh, there's actually evidence that counter to the claims of participatory culture, in fact, it's participatory work which is suffering the most in terms of cuts post-austerity. So that kind of raises the question of what are we actually talking about, about? When we talk about participation, are we talking about the same thing? I'm sure everyone in this room will be acquainted with Arnstein's Ladder of Participation from the 60s, which is um, probably one of the kind of first um, and uh, yeah, most ubiquitous uh, versions of participation that's talked about. But it's very significant. The reason I put it here is also to kind of really emphasise that in this ladder of participation, it's very clear that power and decision-making are at the top of participation. And by definition, if it's a ladder, we can assume that's a hierarchy, that participation is only really meaningful where there's that sense of power and decision-making. But increasingly, from the research I've been doing in the cultural sector, although people are aware of the ladder, they talk about it as a continuum. So a horizontal um, line rather than a ladder. And that um, is very definitely a conscious attempt to make the case that all forms of participation are participation, and in a sense, to take away the need for power and decision-making in part of that process. If we look at the UNESCO definitions of cultural participation, which are about 10 years old now, but um, still kind of very relevant to how the cultural sector often talks about participation, Cultural participation is commonly defined in three ways. On the right, the one kind of that um, we often talk about, the actual attending a cultural event, going to see a show, going to an exhibition. And significantly, the data for that demonstrates that that is the most socially stratified of any of the forms of participation. That's where you're most, you have the narrowest range of people taking part from the most elite positions in society. Conversely, on the left, we've got the idea of participation as actively doing, so participation in activities rather than um, just watching. And most of the claims about participation, about it being good for your well-being, good for um, social inclusion, most of those are actually related to taking part in that way. And yet, it's much less culturally valued. And as I just said on the previous slide, there's actually growing evidence that that's the area that's been cut most post-austerity in Europe. And then the for third form of interaction, which kind of relates to this idea of the participatory culture, which I've just raised, is the idea of interacting. But largely talked about, well, certainly in that report, talked about as interaction through the internet, through social media, through, um, through new technology. And there is a big assumption there, which is increasingly being challenged, that by being online, it means that everybody has access to it. It doesn't mean any more than having access to the theatre that actually it's any more diverse, the people who are interacting with it. And there is, as I say, growing evidence that, that it's a um, socially stratified interaction on the internet. And significantly, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> significantly for the context of this conference, decision-making and governance are not mentioned in that report. They are not generally um, listed as one of the key cornerstones of cultural participation. If I look specifically at a UK context, um, I did an analysis of Arts Council funding applications where, they were, where people were asked to talk about and define what they were doing to address participation. Um, and it really became apparent, I don't expect you to be able to see the graph in, um, in total, but it became, what became really apparent was a very, very broad definition of what people talked about as participation. Over a quarter of those, if you can't see it in detail, over a quarter were just talking about doing marketing, just having a website or um, distributing information about what they were doing was seen as participation. Um, only just slightly more, a third, were actually talking about participation in terms of increasing participation or reaching people beyond the 5 to 10% um, who are said to regularly participate in the arts in the UK. Um, but probably more significant for me was then analysing the Arts Council comments on that. And actually what was very apparent was it didn't matter what people said it just mattered whether they filled in the box on participation. So whether they said they had a website or whether they said people 
were involved in decision making, it was treated with the same level of importance for the Arts Council officers assessing whether to fund or not. And so for me, that kind of really demonstrated the problem with a broad definition of participation and raised the question of whether actually that vagueness becomes a mechanism to maintain the status quo and not change the way things are governed. In other research, there's a growing amount of research that's beginning to talk about the problem of participation and um, as the title of one book, The Tyranny of Participation. And what that argues is that actually the term is becoming so overused from everyone from the World Bank to the smallest community project that actually it runs the risk of becoming, beginning to be meaningless in the way that I was kind of suggesting uh, with the Arts Council applications. The diversity of different aims of different organisations, clearly you know, the World Bank is trying to achieve something very different to what an arts organisation might want to achieve. Um, leads to different approaches, but actually um, it leads to completely different understanding of what we're talking about, about participation. And significantly, I would say, you know, they are valued differently, although the Arts Council don't value them differently when an arts organisation is applying, what people are participating in is valued differently. And I've put some pictures there as to demonstrate that the way that we talk about participation, if you're doing a drumming workshop as being valuable and worthwhile and something to be applauded, but a collective activity in a gaming booth is something worrying and a dangerous trend in society where people are being too hooked into the internet. Um, although there's no evidence that gaming is any worse for you than drumming. Um, and similarly, concerns that people aren't voting as much as they used to be, but equally concerns when they do protest. So is voting actually any more worthwhile than protesting? And so that kind of raises that question about what the purpose of participation is. Is it really to empower people and give them a voice? Or is it sometimes a form of social contro control to paper over the cracks, to make people feel involved without actually bringing about any change. So, <clears throat> why does participation matter for different people? Well, for the UN, we already had some of these um, quoted as reasons why participation is important. And in a sense, you could summarise the top two as being about the social value of it, the rights of people, um, to, to, to participate and the possibility of getting a more inclusive society. The second two more about the individual opportunities of participation, the choice and voice agenda, um, increasing our well-being, which I've already referred to. But then significantly, the last two are becoming more and more talked about in literature, the, the, the saving money through participation, the opportunities it provides, um, to create efficiency gains. And you can really see there kind of how that plays into the austerity agenda quite cleverly. Um, so I kind of characterize all of those different goals as essentially, um, while maybe very worthy on one level, equally problematic in terms of just instrumentalizing um, the notion of both culture and participation. Um, but for arts organizations themselves, the purpose of participation is generally very different. Very often, it's about justifying the money, so making the case to their funders that they're doing a good job, that they are reaching the people that the, their funders want them to reach. But also, it's very often just about numbers, about getting bums on seats, um, if you're in a theatre or yeah, just people through the door. And that's very problematic in terms of a lot of initiatives uh, to look at increasing participation. So, for example, the museum's initiative in the UK, uh, all museums were made free to increase access and participation. Overnight, the numbers of attendances at museums doubled. Therefore, you know, there was a lot of um, evidence and claims that participation had increased in the UK. Yes, it had in terms of number terms, but when you analyse who was participating, it was the same people just visiting more often. And so a real problem there of kind of assuming that numbers equals a wider participation rather than just greater numbers of participation. But for arts organisations, I basically would categorise what most arts organisations are interested in is participating in culture, participating in the activities that they're doing. Um, and 
rather than actually questioning the nature of the, organize, of the activities they're doing. Whereas for their audiences or their participants, it's very often not, it doesn't matter what they're participating in. They're interested in participation through culture, culture being a vehicle to socialize, to have fun, um, to be part of your community. And so actually, whether it's gaming or sport or arts is really quite irrelevant for most participants. It's only for the cultural sector that it really matters that it's culture that they're participating in. So as a result of that, <clears throat> I would say that the focus um, on arts participation has been far too much on the idea of democratisation of culture, giving people access to what the cultural sector already does. And generally speaking, if people don't participate, they're the ones with the problem. The, the people out there have a deficit that they don't understand the arts, they don't understand um, the potential it has for them, rather than that the arts has something to learn for them. And I would say that in very broad terms, that, you can, that is characterised by the types of programmes we see, which are education activities to improve people's understanding of the arts, um, outreach programmes to, to make a connection between what they're doing out there and the institutions back over here, or cheap tickets on the assumption that it, the barrier is because people can't afford to come. But there's a fundamental failure still, I would argue, in many um, parts of the cultural sector to actually value what people are doing already. People are participating. All the research, they're not sitting um, by and large uh, entirely on their own. Even if they're hanging around on street corners with their mates, they're still participating. They're just participating in something we're not valuing. So I think there's a kind of question there um, about moving towards a more cultural democracy approach that's actually understanding what people value themselves rather than just hanging on to what we already do. And as a result of this focus on democratisation of culture, I think is one of the barriers to looking at new governance models and one of the reasons why many of the traditional governance models that I started the presentation with still exist today. So this kind of has led um, to what many people have argued is a crisis in legitimacy in the arts. There's kind of growing evidence that actually a post-austerity, there's declining support for funding for the arts. In, interestingly, in England, kind of a range of surveys have said that actually it's, um, support for the principle of funding for the arts is largely maintained, but there's increasing disillusionment with what the funding is spent on. And so that kind of real question of uh, whether the public have a sense of what they would like to see the money spent on instead. There's also, despite talking about this being an agenda for more than 50 years, and particularly a policy priority since millennium, there's real kind of evidence that, um, that, the, that the audiences aren't changing. There's been almost no shift in the diversity of who participates in the UK, certainly. And interestingly, in Denmark, my other example, actually the figures for participation are very high there compared with England. There's real evidence people are culturally active, but not culturally active in the, the, the activities that are funded. Um, and also, this kind of crisis is linked to the fact that uh, the arts, many people would say, are actually behind the curve in terms of approaches to participatory government, governance, that they've actually been late adopters to many of the processes that are being seen in other parts of the public sector. And so what, what I and others have been calling for is a real look at the distribution of funding and a redistribution of funding, I would go as far as to say, um, and a look at how the public might be involved in decision making. People, I'm sure, well, many people will also be aware of John Holden's public value triangle, um, which uh, he uh, posited as a kind of uh, solution to some of this, of saying that actually we needed to get away from that narrow range of voices that, uh, that was just professionals and policy makers talking to each other and bring in the public into that um, dialogue. And that, that kind of was, in a sense, in the UK, certainly one of the first real kind of articulations of the need for more participatory governance. And as such, has been very valuable and useful. But for me, it's also very problematic, because although it says who should be involved, it doesn't say anything about how to involve them. 
It assumes a kind of consensual agreement that we'll all sit down together and agree that we want the same things rather than recognizing that there might be different interests at stake. It ignores what we do about dissenting voices um, and what we do about that some, certainly in the cultural sector, some of the most interesting and exciting work might come from the left field. And it also ignores the power relationships between those different parties. You can talk to them all, it doesn't mean you listen to them. If we take more traditional um, approaches to participatory governance from outside <coughs> of the sector, and I've adapted this from the participatory budgeting model, it's very clear from those approaches that they're talking about process, not just who, but how. Uh, and the key principles there being about people being involved from the point of setting the agenda, not once we already know what we want to do, just involving them in talking about how to do it better, but actually what do we want to do in the first place. <clears throat> it's very much about seeing the public as having agency in that process and having um, their own <coughs> knowledge and expertise, not just the recipient or the beneficiary of the activities that we're offering them. And it's absolutely founded on the principle, not of representative democracy, not of kind of um, a referendum on everything, but on a wider range of voices being heard in that process. But there are critics of this kind of work as well. There are definitely people who say that actually having more people involved doesn't necessarily mean that they have any more power, um, that the very notion of agency is dubious, that actually it's very easy for new voices to be subsumed and um, dominated by existing voices. And I think we can see elements of that within the cultural sector and public policy generally, where lots of these initiatives are still top-down initiatives for what many would say should be a bottom-up process. In practice, consultation is much more common than decision-making, asking people what they want, but not actually necessarily and those people having any sense of how that's been acted on. And there's real evidence of um, people talk about consultation fatigue, of people becoming actually more disengaged if they're asked their opinion and they're not listened to. I always give the example of York near where I live, where uh, every year they do a survey for the public of what they would like to see in York. Every year the public vote for a firework display. Every year the council ignore their calls for a firework display. Um, so what's the point of asking the question, is what I'm asking. Um, and also, clearly, there are questions about how do you know that it's new voices and not just the same people just having even more voice than they did already, or the usual suspects, as I've referred to it there. So I refer to this sort of sense that um, the arts are seen as late adopters of this process, and so I kind of... it's. Sort of, seems important to think why that might be. And I think one of the reasons is kind of potentially fair enough, the sense um, of it being yet another imposition by policymakers that the cultural sector hasn't been involved in framing themselves, yet another um, trend that we're going through that may come and go. I mean, it, certainly in the, in the UK, it was law for um, under new labor that uh, all public agents had to involve the public in decision making as soon as the Conservative Liberal Coalition came in, they got rid of that. So, you know, that kind of idea that it might shift anyway. But also there are concerns from politicians themselves. There's, and certainly in a local context, many local authorities say, well, that's what we were voted for, to be representative. Why do you need another democratic process? Why do you need to involve people? They, they get to vote for us once a year. Surely that's enough. Um, but I think also particularly in a sector like... Um, like the arts and culture, where there's been a kind of real, that, that kind of, um, the, the importance of preserving artistic integrity, it really challenges the notion of expertise. Uh, and uh, although I don't think anyone is suggesting artists themselves should be creating work through de public decision making, I think cultural organisations are often quite good at kind of framing themselves in that same position as the, as the individual artist who'd be compromised by talking to the public. And I've kind of put quotes there from people saying they would, they'd resign if they even had to talk to their audience, which I think is quite interesting. That's from a multi-million pound um, new, a new gallery, uh, who I won't name. Uh, but also there's a real sense from people I talk to about kind of quite a, quite a high degree 
of contempt for their audiences and for the public and a nation that they have bad taste. And why would you possibly want to ask them about their taste? But I don't think any of those claims are supported by the evidence from practice. So I'm now going to go through some examples of practice and kind of um, attempt to dispel some of the, the concerns about participatory processes that, that were voiced there. So I'm starting with kind of national policy um, processes and the kind of key theories that underpin them kind of really demonstrate that they come from different traditions in themselves. So the first one I've kind of identified there is the idea of public value. And this is something that both the BBC and the Arts Council in England have really adopted. Um, and that, that's very much taking the survey approach to asking people what they think of the arts and culture, uh, what they would like to see. But interestingly, they themselves would describe the process of that, as it says there, as helping them communicate better with the public, not of changing what they do, not of actually involving them in decision making, just of understanding how to talk in a better language to them. Um, then there's kind of the, um, the growth of approaches about co-production. And again, um, from a national perspective, that is normally something that is kind of passed down to deliverers as a requirement or a recommendation to think about more co-productive processes. And that is about kind of the blurring between the amateur and the professional. And we see that through um, a lot in kind of activities where kind of professionals perform on stage with amateurs or um, the public are involved in programming seasons of work in galleries or in theatres. Um, then there's the, the participatory budgeting, which uh, comes from Brazil originally, but it's been adopted pretty much worldwide. And that initially was very much about redistributive investment, was initially very much about how do we actually involve people in deciding where the money gets spent, which was the number one thing that people asked for in the public value surveys uh, in England. Um, but in practice, what we see is very often that's very small pots of money and it's kind of experiments with uh, small projects rather than actually about the whole kind of planning um, of, of cultural provision. And then certainly in the UK, there's a growing uh, approach based on asset transfers, which is labelled under the participatory policy approach, which is about actually the state washing its hands of art centres, cinemas, parks, libraries, and saying if the public want it, they can run it for themselves. So um, actually using that as a kind of use it or lose it approach to the choice and voice agenda, that actually if there aren't enough people fighting to save this art centre, then, then that's a good reason to cut it. And that um, aspect is obviously very worrying for the sector. So I kind of identified those um, as the sort of four main strands of national policy. Um, but, but actually, in practice, they're kind of much more delivered on a local basis. There's very limited evidence of thinking about participatory governance at a national level. So looking at kind of some examples of local initiatives, I've, I've kind of chosen three that sort of represent different approaches. Um, so the first... Aarhus 2017, the capital of culture this year, as was referred to, who I've been working with for the last couple of years. Um, their, their whole bid was written through a participatory process in which uh, they say 8,000 people were involved in consultation. Uh, it, 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 took, it involved all 19 local authorities, so they aspired to not just be a city of culture, but a region of culture. And it was really... Through that process, they decided that their focus was absolutely as culture in the broadest definition of the term rather than the professional arts. So culture as habitat, as it says there. Um, and as a result of that, the budget is split between local initiatives and the central pot. Um, the, the, the governance of it itself is split between the arts organisation who are delivering the stuff in Aarhus itself and lots of uh, local regional governance structures of specific aspects of the program. And so that, there's a real question there about whether that is offering new models, and particularly in the localities outside of the centre, whether that's offering new opportunities and new models where they've experimented with participatory budgeting, they've experimented with co-commissioning and such like. 
But equally, a number of people are saying that actually, um, at the same time as all of that is happening, the culture houses, who are the more amateur run community based organizations, are being cut often to, to support this kind of work. That many of the traditional organizations are seen as treading on the toes of the more community based work. And many people saying, yeah, 8,000 people were consulted, but they didn't have much power. So there are questions there about how far that goes. And I've given the example of Creative People and Places, which is a British um, a £37 million Arts Council Action Research Project, which is looking at what happens if you give money to places and let them decide what to spend it on themselves. So it specifically focuses on places that have been designated as low in rates of participation. And it's, and it's a requirement that each consortium in each place has to consult people about what they want to take place. Um, and initially, I was working at the Arts Council when this was first being devised. Initially, it was very definitely seen as an experiment. So if you give money to those places, it makes a case for culture, you'd go on investing if they're successful. But actually, what's increasingly become the case is that people are criticizing creative from people and places as actually taking money away from lots of the community activities and professionalizing one institution, which is the cultural institution for the town. Uh, and in some cases, sucking money from other towns as well. So, there, so, so it's kind of been a really interesting model in trying new ways of governance, but it's also uh, increasingly been seen as creating its own problem in its own right. And then the last example I've got there is my hometown of Hebden Bridge, uh, where the community, and there's a question of how we define the community there, have taken control of the town hall, which has been turned into a cultural quarter, and the cinema, which is a independent um, alternative cinema with showing world cinema and such like. And, that, and that's um, an example of where it absolutely was the community who took, uh, made the decision to bid for those organisations. But the reason that the council was so happy to let the community take control was because it took away their responsibility. They no longer have to fund those organisations and some me it's a real kind of example of that problem of in a town like I live, where there's lots of high capacity individuals, as the council themselves praise us, um, who can take control of the cultural assets. It's much easier to do than in a place that's really under resourced, like the creative people and places areas were. And then kind of I'm just um, going on to some institutional responses where arts organizations or cultural organizations have uh, looked at kind of participatory governance themselves. Again, I've kind of got three examples. First is a theatre in Britain, Contact Theatre, who now just called Contact, uh, who since the millennium, so a long time now, have kind of had an approach which is about participatory governance. It's about people being involved in decision making at every level of the organisation, from interviewing for the new artistic director to programming what goes on on stage. And it's very commonly cited as kind of the beacon of success in England. But it's a kind of interesting now, 15, 17, 17 years into that strategy, they're now on their third artistic director since the person who started it. And the more you look at it, the more you can see the different processes. And, and, that, um, and so although it's still a participatory organisation, what that means has really changed. So that kind of really raises a question of how much these processes become embedded and how much power those users really have or how much it is just about the processes of the leadership in a, in a quite traditional way, in effect. Then I've kind of um, put up the, um, a library for the Democracy Baton, which is a library project in Denmark as part of Aarhus um, 2017, which involves libraries across the whole region in looking at what happens when you let young people take over the library and say what they want the library to be. And they're short-term experiments, but they're kind of really um, started from the point of view of really rethinking what the role of the library was for the 21st century. But actually, what's increasingly become apparent is that they're working with existing users, not bringing in new people, uh, and that it's much more about how does the library justify its existence and they're, they're particularly one of the areas where some of the culture houses say that they're taking over and treading on their toes, rather than really kind of changing the way they operate. And then the last example I've given is Institute X, which is very much is a squat, um, a creative space where it's just been squatted and taken over. 
as a really kind of artist-led approach. And they talk about themselves as a duocracy, not a democracy. So it's for people who want to get on and do, and they're just given the space, break all the rules, do it your own way. And so I put that there kind of because that, that kind of challenges that question of do we have to always um, ask people or, or do sometimes the best ideas come from people just doing it for themselves. But in the same way as with the Hebden Bridge model, I think there are real questions there about whether you end up just having the same high capacity people who would have been doing it anyway, whether it actually offers anything that's really alternative. So just kind of um, coming to a conclusion then, we're kind of what they all have in common, I think, all the examples I've talked about, is that rhetoric about participatory governance or participatory decision making. I think they all, in their different ways, do demonstrate the potential of such approaches, both in terms of getting people involved. Um, all of them cite increased numbers, uh, as I say, with varying degrees of whether that's increased um, diversity, but certainly increased numbers. All of them have the potential to help the organizations rethink what they do for themselves. And most of them say that actually have, t taking on board those processes has helped them raise money from different sources um, to where they got money from in the past. Um, but, as I've demonstrated, they all are very, very different in their approaches in the, and in the outcomes and in the challenges they face. And as a such, they run the risk of actually adding to that problem of does participatory decision-making or governance mean anything more than participation itself did, as I demonstrated at the, minute, at the beginning. So there is a real challenge for me there, and that's really evident in Creative People and Places, the Action Research Project, um, about the, the tension between wanting places to define them for themselves, to have bespoke approaches everywhere, do it in their own way, but actually, the more everyone does it in their own way, the harder it is to actually see whether, um, whether, whether the, the decision-making is meaningful. So I would argue, if we're kind of trying to think about, so what are the meaningful approaches? What do we want to see for kind of uh, participatory governance to be meaningful? Is that the recruitment process, who you involve, how you get them involved, how you reach out beyond the usual suspects or your existing users, is as important as the tools you use themselves. Very often people talk about what they do when, when they've got people in a room, Less than, and you know, much less do they talk about how they get people in the room in the first place. <clears throat> it absolutely, for me, has to be a two-way learning process. It has to be that the cultural organisation wants to learn and wants to change, is willing to change, um, as much as that they see themselves as teacher educating people to appreciate what they do. It has to give the space for dissent and not just look for consensus. There's real problems with uh, strategies that have involved just having a public vote at the end of them and that often reinforcing um, conservative outcomes rather than allowing for kind of creative opportunities. Uh, and so obviously that is then complex in, in how you deal with uh, dissenting voices. It needs to use a range of different uh, approaches. I've, I've seen some disastrous approaches where they've got really good range of people in the room and then have a kind of formal presentation um, disc meeting room kind of, that just doesn't suit the participants that are there. But probably most important, there needs evidence of change if you want people to keep engaging. That in processes where people don't actually see the outcome of the discussion, they vanish and you end up creating greater disengagement rather than engagement. So then just kind of finally, to summarise, um, I think that there is still a problem in the arts and cultural sector about uh, the power of a very small number of voices um, and, that, and I would argue that that needs to shift but I don't see a lot of appetite for that when I'm interviewing people. I see a lot of appetite for change from participants. I see a lot of appetite for change often from artists themselves uh, but very, very often, I see barriers within the cultural institutions themselves. I think there are real positive case studies, the ones I've talked about, but also I'm sure many in this room and internationally, of, of where um, these processes have been used in action. Um, but there is, I kind of will just end with that kind of question and threat about 
it provides real opportunities, I think, but it also does provide threats, certainly to the existing power structures, which needs to be taken into account. Thank you. That's it. I don't know if there is time for questions or... Well, um... This works, right? Uh, yeah, we were quite late to start off with, so we don't have much time for questions, but if you agree, we can possibly obviously, take I'm a... I'm here for the next three days, so obviously people can talk to me. Yeah, but are there any immediate reflections or questions? Just a few. Could you just introduce yourself, please? Hi. My name is Arundhati, and I've come from India. I found your um, presentation very interesting. I have one particular question that refers to not just uh, the political situation in my country, but world over in a sort of the strong right-wing shift of most political spaces. In that context, if the arts and culture's role is also to challenge ways of being, challenge the dominant narratives that are being put in place by some of the more conservative right-wing powers. How does processes of participation, in fact, process of, of participation can often um, ally with those kinds of ideas that one has seen, especially in our country, where minority crisis is a big thing now. So in that place, like you said, um, voices of dissent, how does one ensure that it does not become a, once again a mainstream dominant narrative, popular choice of decisions? Um, because democracy itself is being questioned today. So how do we keep talking about democratic processes being uh, part of this decision making and keeping those dissenting voices alive? I'm, I'm just... It's a question, but it's also a reflection, and I'm just thinking through it, um, especially given today's political conditions. Yeah, um, I mean, and I think what I was saying is that is a real risk, and it is definitely being used by right-wing governments question. as much as left-wing governments um, as, as a process for both justifying the status quo or for... You know, excuses to make cuts. So yes, that is absolutely a danger of some of these processes. I would say that that is where, just as democracy, so I think democ representative democracy, and I said you know, the problem about voting, um, that's why that's problematic. I think you get conservative outcomes if you, if you, if you use that process. I think where it is more a deliberative process, so you know, more and more people are talking about deliberative democracy rather than representative democracy, where people are involved in discussions and where they, their voices are heard, I think actually what you see is that those, you can shift those positions and you can shift some of the tensions in a community, as you were describing. But that does mean that you have to have a diverse range of people there. And it does mean that you have to accept you might not have a comfortable outcome. So I think that's kind of what I'm, I'm agreeing with you, that actually if you vote on what artwork you want or you vote on what government you want, then you know, be careful what you wish for. Um, but if you actually have a discussion that allows difficult conversations to take place, then actually people, and, and this is demonstrated in practice, not just in theory, that, that people are more willing to take risks, they're more willing to go with more, um, more of experimental work, if we're talking about the arts, and they're more willing to actually engage in some of those difficult conversations. A lot of the creative people and places are in areas that voted Brexit, and that's been a real interesting challenge for them, that they're there trying to increase participation in areas that actually don't want them there. But I would say that's exactly why you do need to be doing these processes, to have a conversation with those people rather than ignore them. Any more questions? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much for this really inspiring uh, keynote speech. I would just like to comment something regarding the European Capitals of Culture. You mentioned Aarhus. Aarhus is a well-known case. Uh, 
Uh, there are other cities like San Sebastian, for example, who also had participatory projects, uh, participatory budgeting uh, as a tool for, for involving uh, 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 audiences and, uh, and communities. Uh, also, um, the European Commission and the panel is stressing participatory moment as one of the criteria according to which cities are, are being uh, evaluated nowadays. It's really challenging how to achieve true results without going into manipulation and uh, uh, we also, we had, um, uh, during our bidding process, we involved uh, communities, we had uh, uh, discussions, uh, uh, invited people to, to participate uh, into the design of our bid, not as much as in Aarhus. And also we are planning to have uh, specific budgets and specific tools to, to, to stress this participatory moment. But one more time, um, it's going to be really challenging not to go into into something that is that is uh, that will remain to be superficial. So I hope I w we would really have more time to discuss this uh, this with you. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to um, discuss with you. I mean, two just two points I'd make on that, but we can talk about it in more detail. Um, one, yes, I think the European Capital of Culture is a perfect example of where you're asked to address participation. Um, but actually, the very way you asked to address it can be part of the problem. So one of the things that Aarhus said was there was so much pressure for them to have ambitious number targets of how many people they were going to participate, get to participate, that that actually works against that very process of deliberative democracy with a small number of people that we know is actually what works in practice. That you could put on one event and get 100,000 people but that, and hit your number targets, but it does nothing for actually rethinking anything. Um, so, I fully appreciate that kind of there's, there, the, the base process of bidding can set you up, up with problems as well. Um, and also, I think Aarhus, there's, there's a lot of criticism in Aarhus that, it, that, that there was a shift between the bid document, which involved people, and then the delivery organisation, which didn't involve people so much. And depending on who you ask, the question is, is that just the nature of when you've got to deliver, it's hard work and you don't have time to do it? Or is it the structures of how the delivery organisation was set up and the governance structures there? And that's something we could discuss, maybe. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Leila, for the, for the presentation. Yep, I will. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Jordi from Jordi Balta from Barcelona, um, and there's there's a couple of, of of questions I wanted to raise. One is I'm I'm working with the Committee on Culture of United Cities and Local Governments, and one of the one of the cities we've been in contact with is uh, Belo Horizonte in Brazil, that has as, as other Brazilian cities a, a record of uh, participatory budgeting, and and that's one of the techniques you you mentioned. Uh, one of the results of that process has been that across the city, a number of cultural centers have been established because basically neighbors uh, asked for that in those areas of the city in which there, there weren't uh, sufficient cultural facilities. Uh, uh, I understood when you referred to participatory budgeting that in the context of the UK, possibly this is being used in other areas rather than culture. And of course, I'm, I'm aware that... Um, let's say, in a process like the one in Belo Horizonte, where uh, neighbours can ask for any kind of facility, whether it's educational or social or cultural, that poses a risk because there's no guarantee that uh, that would be priority given to culture. So, I mean, I can see both a positive and a negative side to that kind of process. And I wanted to ask you about your thoughts on, let's say, to what extent participatory budgeting can be a relevant technique from a cultural perspective, you know, the, in, in terms of broadening uh, the availability of resources or not, or what kind of guarantees or what kind of uh, earmarking should be uh, relevant, or, or if in the context of your research you've explored this, this particular issue uh, more in depth. Uh, the second issue has to do with, um, in terms of citizen participation, probably not so much at the level of a particular arts organization or a, or a venue, but more in terms of broader policy. What, what is the role uh, 
of uh, organized civil society organizations, whether it's NGOs or foundations or associations, because I mean, at city level or at regional level, often it might be difficult for individuals uh, to be involved, but there might be a, a role for intermediary organization. And of course, there's, there might be challenges in that if, if it's only professionals being represented, that might uh, incline the discussion in a particular uh, sense. Uh, I don't know if in the context of your research you've explored that particular role of uh, intermediary or independent or, or NGOs, etc., that, that kind of level, and what are the challenges and opportunities that you see for that to be a step towards citizen engagement uh, and more plural uh, governance? That, that would be a second issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, so on the first question about um, to what extent, yeah, the, the risks of participatory budgeting um, for culture. It's, it's an interesting, that that's actually one of the main reasons why the Arts Council and the cultural sector said they didn't want to adopt participatory budgeting. Um, but it was, as I mentioned, a requirement under New Labour. Participatory budgeting it's, itself was a requirement under New Labour that every local authority would have to take on board and the Arts Council commissioned research trying to make the case why they shouldn't have to do it because it's too complicated for culture. Pretty much everyone I interviewed said, nobody will vote for culture. Actually, that wasn't true in practice. And I suppose I would say that shows a real defensiveness of the cultural sector of assuming that people don't want culture. I think actually people do. They just might not want exactly what they're being offered or the way it's being offered. In many, many local authorities who wanted people to vote for improving the roads or... Um, social care they actually people were voting for culture and so it actually completely bucked expectations that culture was seen as much much more important than people thought but you know it was that they wanted activities for their kids to do or they wanted something to bring the community together they didn't want the arts they didn't have that kind of our definitions of what that provision might be but they definitely did want cult the money spent on cultural activity so I think I would say the cultural sector needs to be braver and more confident with those processes. Um, as you say, in Brazil, actually, it has kind of led to the development of um, art centres, cultural centres in specific communities that hadn't had such facilities in the creative people and places areas. They're, what they're really finding is an absolute thirst for activity, not that they're having trouble getting people to engage. But there are problems, as I said, about kind of institutionalising that. And then in terms of your second question, um, yeah, slightly more kind of problematic, the, the question of civil organisations and kind of NGOs and professionals as the participants we engage with. Um, I would say that probably that is the model that we tend to have too often, and I think that's problematic. And I think the, in pretty much all the cases I've looked at, uh, they would say many of the creative people and places started with kind of community associations, the brokers to people. And actually what they found was that those became problematic gatekeepers in the same way. And that actually that real kind of difficult conversation, seeing things differently, required talking to people, not looking for representatives of communities, but looking just for people and diverse people to kind of have a um, richer conversation. That doesn't mean there isn't a role for professionals. I absolutely do think it's about professionals and it's about the expertise of everybody, which includes the, uh, the professional sector. But I think that where it just becomes the classic model of public uh, value that comes from America actually doesn't involve, it's called public value, but it didn't even involve the public. It only involved those um, civil actors. And I think that is very problematic. And I think that becomes kind of very managerial and very um, a, a limitation to change, not an opportunity for change. Work? Okay, great. So this question goes maybe to more theoretical assumption of the debates around participation. Obviously, one strong element is understanding that uh, there is demos, that there is people where everybody is equal, so uh, society's set of um, equal individuals, equally free individuals. But I think that frequently, uh, participation debate in culture 
flattens out uh, the aggregation of people within society that expresses itself through culture. It's frequently a group phenomenon, not an individual phenomenon. So I feel that there is kind of individualism that underlies the, much of the debate uh, around participation and that just ignores how pluriform culture as a structure is. No, it, it understands, aha, uh -huh, there are users and there are providers. So users are all equal, they are all flattened, but it, we know that culture is not like that. There are groups, they have their values, they have their assumptions, they work as a group, they are not addressable as individuals ultimately uh, in their cultural capacity. And therefore, my question would be, where are the scales in the analysis and where are the aggregates in the analysis, not just individuals and, and or users, providers? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for me, I, I think for me, it. Um, well, firstly, obviously, I don't. I mean, clearly, I'm saying that we're not all equal, are we? I mean, definitely, some are more equal than others, and I think that actually, that I think, in a sense, I completely agree. There is a risk in that kind of. Um, representative democracy approach that sees a levelling out. I would say there is a risk in that kind of working through representative organisations that creates a levelling out. I think what I'm talking about is the need to actually recognise there are different voices, there are different cultures. There isn't kind of the shared culture that, we're, that the, I think the art sector encourages us to buy into, that we, kind of, we all actually want to engage in the same kind of things. So I think I'm much more kind of talking in favour of a nuanced understanding that, that people have different interests and there are different power dynamics. I'm not suggesting that, um, that, that arts and culture alone is going to change that, but I think at the moment arts and culture reinforces that and that's the issue for me that I think we need to look at new structures that actually challenge that within ourselves if we're going to then claim that we're challenging it in wider society. I think the arts too often claims that it's challenging and controversial and difficult and actually is just speaking to itself. 